Hey, John, thank you so much for taking the time this evening to uh, be on this podcast. If you could please tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Hey, no problem. Happy to be here. Um, I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area um, in Texas. I'm 50 years old. I got two teenage kids. And uh, right now I've got uh, 10 properties, nine single family rentals in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I have one vacation rental, a short-term rental in uh, Branson, Missouri. I started investing. Uh, I got kind of a late start when I was 44 years old. So six years ago, we bought um, a vacation rental in uh, Branson, Missouri. And uh, that's kind of how I, I got started and uh, kind of got the real estate bug and have been just picking up. I think I ended up, I ended up getting uh, 10 properties in the first five years. So I'm pretty happy with that. I might pick up maybe one or two uh, additional ones in the next couple of years or something, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. Okay. And then what got you into real estate investing? So um, I always thought it was, it'd be a really neat thing to, to be a real estate investor, but to be honest, I was really nervous to be a landlord. <laughs> okay. I'm not, uh, I'm not that handy. I don't want to deal with, uh, I was kind of nervous to deal with like uh, tenants calling me about, you know, plumbing issues or this or that. And I didn't really want to be bothered. So we were on vacation, we rented a cabin and I thought, gosh, it would be nice to own one of these vacation rentals and, um, and just have a property manager out of state, just deal with it all. So I happened to see one two doors down from where we we're staying, had a for sale sign on it, called a listing agent. We walked through it. I loved it. And um, they were asking 137000 And she said the seller was firm on that price. And um, about two or three days later, when we got home, I decided to um, make an offer over an email to the listing agent for 128000 I only had $30,000 in savings. Um, this is pretty dumb deal. I didn't think they'd accept, but I just thought I would just see and find out. Make a long story short, the seller um, accepted our offer at 130,000, a home equity line of credit from my primary house. I took, it was a 38,000. And then uh, I took out 62,000 from our Roth IRAs, the money we put over the years. I always put two or 3,000 a year each, you know, some years. Um, and it had accumulated up to quite a bit. And I was able to take out up to $92,000, I believe at the time, tax-free, just the principal. So I took out 62 from there, 38 from the HELOC and the $30,000 uh, from savings. And we got our first rental and we paid cash. We barely did it. It was a, kind of a stretch to get the bank to get our HELOC in time, but we were able to uh, close on it. And that was great. It was turnkey, it was furnished. Um, the property manager already had people like lined up and it was renting out really well. And uh, we had that for about maybe seven or eight months until I got excited about another one <laughs> that was uh, for sale in the same neighborhood, same area in Branson, Missouri. That was foreclosure. I paid uh, $60,000 cash for it. Um, I, and before I started in real estate, I was kind of a Dave Ramsey guy. The only mortgage, the only loan I ever had was my house mortgage. Um, cars are always paid off. I always paid everything in cash or paid my credit cards off 100% every month. So I really was not too into leveraging and taking out more loans, leveraging my money, just because that was kind of my mindset. Well, um, the second house came along, I thought this is too good to be true. $60,000 market rate was about 85,000. So I thought, wow, this is a good deal. Um, I took a 401 K loan out. I took more money on my the HELOC and uh, maybe out of savings. All the money I was using for my first one went into real estate into the second one. So now I've got two properties paid in cash and they were renting out pretty good, but my cash on cash was not that great. Okay. Um, after all my expenses, property manager fees, it was 30% up there for this vacation rental. That took a hit. Um, okay. HOA fees and all that stuff. I was only making maybe 5% or 6% cash on cash with all that money I had invested. Um, that wasn't that exciting to me. <laughs> Got my real estate properties, but that's kind of where I was looking at. About a year and a half later, some realtor offered me, said, I've got a client that wants to buy your my smaller cabin for $100,000. And I thought, okay, I'll sell it for a hundred thousand. So I made a quick $40,000 for having it for only about a year and a half. 
So I decided to do a 1031 exchange so I wouldn't have to pay any uh, capital gains or taxes on it. And I thought this will be my opportunity to get a single family rental near me in the, the Dallas Fort Worth area. So I did the 1031 exchange and I put all that money into a, um, a four bedroom, three bath, $225,000 single family home, pretty much turnkey. I just actually the day I got the keys to it, I had a tenant moving in. Um, and so that's kind of how I started with the, uh, the single families. And I found that leveraging, I was getting a lot more bang for my buck. I found out borrowing money from uh, somebody else, a bank, you can really uh, increase your, your return on your, your investment on your money. Yeah. So that really excited me. That kind of got the numbers spooling in my head thinking, gosh, what if I just put 20% down on a house? I didn't have any money. So I went to my bank and I said, well, you, can I get a cash out refi? I had some equity in my primary house. So they gave me $100,000 on a cash out refi in my primary house. And okay. um, I used that money to just put 20% down on a property, $100,000 property, boom. And um, my return on investment on that cash on cash was really good. Like right now I've got the numbers. It's like 80, 84% a year off that 20% down. I was like, dang, this is good. Yeah, that is. Um, good. That includes, that's included if, if you, if you count 5% appreciation, which you might not ever, you might not get 5% every year, but if I use 5% appreciation, my principal pay down from the, my mortgage, which was like, I don't know, 380 bucks a month. And then my cash flow, my monthly cash flow off that thing is like 344 a month. So I'm thinking, dang, I'm getting really good money off that. Um, my $20,000. So I went and bought another house for about 125,000. Then I went and bought another house and I literally bought four houses within one year, just putting um, two in my 1031 exchange. And I bought three of these, just putting 20% down uh, just because I saw the power of leverage. So that's kind yes. of, that's kind of how I started off. Um, and then I, I, I had some other methods later on, but um, that's kind of, that kind of got me excited using the leverage. Are you finding all these deals on the MLS? Or are you are you finding? Uh, uh, yes, I found um, almost all of them except one off the MLS so far. Um, one of them was through a, a friend. He had a uh, a rental property he just wanted to get rid of, so I just I bought his, kept the existing tenants, and um, and that was pretty good too because I didn't have to. Uh, they've been there for seven years. They're construction workers. Actually, I hire them right now. They do all my rehabs. Oh wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, so that, it's worked. It's worked out. But I found most of them off the MLS um, out of the 10 properties I have now. I think I got maybe three or four off market through friends or word of mouth. My contractor who I hire, he actually found me too somehow. <laughs> he knew I'd give him the work. Um, so I got some really good deals off those um, and uh, bird one of them. How do you like being a landlord? it's actually a lot easier than I thought. Sometimes I wonder if I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> um, all my tenants, they just contact me by text. I rarely ever get a phone call. And, and I'd say I get maybe one text a month <laughs> with an issue. And if it's an issue, it's usually something easy, like um, an H, the air, air conditioning goes out during the summer. I probably get three of those, you know, where they just got to fix like a, a quick uh, fuse or something. I just text an HVAC guy to go fix it. Um, every once in a while I get a, a plumbing issue I had last week. I just text my guy to go fix a sewer line. So that's, that's about it. It's pretty easy to uh, manage on my own. Um, I don't have any problems with that. It's easy to uh, list it on. I list them on Zillow manager online, all the applications and um, background checks and um, stuff comes through online through the Zillow manager. So that's easy to find people. I list them. I usually get about, 50 to 60 inquiries within a gosh within a, a couple of days and i usually i usually rent them out within two or three days if i find a good uh uh tenant to put it in there so as far as being a landlord what i was scared nervous for all these years <laughs> it's actually pretty easy so it's, far but i've only been i've only been doing this for six years so i'm sure it could pile up but for the most part it's not too bad is zillow manager a paid service uh, yeah, they charge you nine ninety nine a week, but it's free for the first time you use it. But um, you can put up to I think ten pictures, 
and it goes on Zillow. I think a couple other websites like Trulia and Hot Pads. So it gets really good exposure. But um, I find people within a couple of days. So it's ten bucks. It's the best ten bucks I ever spent. <laughs> Some people complain about it. They don't want to pay. They mm-hmm. think it's a rip off to pay ten dollars. But to have a really wide pool of applicants um people versus some people just put them on maybe facebook or um craigslist or something but um i get really good qual- quality qualified people through zill manager and they pay the application fee so it's 29 dollars for the applicants and it does uh, their application and their background and the credit checks and all that and it, and it comes right to me so i can before i show it to them i can get their whole background and kind of know if they're a good fit on paper and when I meet them, if they seem um, they, if they if it, they seem legit, then I hand them the keys and get the deposit and go from there. Do you think it's uh it's been pretty easy because you have turnkey? Sound like you have a few turnkey properties, and then you've birthed. So you think that's what has added to you less likely outsourcing with a property manager, and it's been easier for you to be a, a landlord slash property manager with your own properties. Uh, yes, and I did have one property manager on a on a property I bought that had an existing tenant you know that was nice it was 10 percent um and they had this tenant in there for a while it was a section eight tenant um it was pretty easy but when she would have problems I found it was easier for me to use she was communicating to me more than the property manager and when they when she contacted the property manager it ended up cost me a lot more the vendors they were using to fix the little things where my guy could be there in an hour and do it for you know half the price or something so, and then if she had issues, she ended up contacting me and I felt like uh, I could resolve the issues faster than the um, property manager. So I, from then on, I'm like, I'll just do it all myself. And so you mentioned earlier in our conversation before the podcast that you wanted to not have like massive amount of units and then you want to kind of keep it manageable. Uh, how come that's your goal? Right. Well, kind of to keep the headaches down to a minimum. Um, I figure I could, I could leverage more and do like all my loans are 15 year loans. I could do 30 year loans and have higher cash flow and get more properties. So instead of having 10, I could have maybe 20 or 30, but that's 20 or 30 extra properties you're dealing with as far as, uh, things going, breaking down. Uh, I do my own taxes on TurboTax and 10 properties is easy for me, but I, I feel like the more properties I get, the more issues, the more time consuming it'll be, but 10 properties seems really easy and it doesn't take up that much time. Um, sure. I could outsource, I could hire property managers and, um, accountants to deal with all that stuff. But for me, 10 works out good. And my kind of, one of my goals was to have, uh, about 10 to $12,000 a month, uh, net after all my expenses, um, with my rentals and 10 properties kind of gives me that number so right now with the, the rentals i have um on average i'd say they're probably like a two, they're probably worth like two hundred thousand dollars each some are you know give or take fifty thousand but um right now if i retired um it would be about ten to twelve thousand a month net which is perfect for me because that'll supplement my 401k um and that's so having having a fewer amount uh means a little more but if i keep growing and double my it might just be uh too much of a headache plus uh, yeah. i don't know if my wife would be happy it, it was a stretch to get her to let me get more than two rentals to be honest it was uh she was really against it for a few several years <laughs> until about this year actually <laughs> well yeah so uh, i don't know if I talk her into that <laughs> you scraped up you scraped up a hundred grand i don't know i you're the first person i've ever known to even do that so i can only imagine uh, how compromising um she was in order for you to do that that, that was a lot and that was Talk about not letting a, a huge obstacle like that get in the way, because I don't think I would have been even had like the thought process, like how can I scrape up a hundred grand and what you did it like in 30 days? No, two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> I had to push the closing back, the closing date back two days. I mean, I was sweating it. I had to go. The hardest thing, like I said, was to go to my bank and get the, the home equity line of credit. I had them on going like nonstop to get me that 38,000. Fortunately, I had the uh, the Roth IRA and I could take that money out tax free. Um, so I've always been saving. I started my Roth IRAs in my 20s. So by the time I was 44, my first rental, I had at least some money built up where I could just grab that. So I always really encourage people that are starting off. What should I do? And where should I save my money? I say, just chuck it in a Roth IRA. And I had it in stocks. 
just buy stocks, mutual funds, index funds. Um, and when you're ready for your rental, you can just take that money out. So I always knew that would be either emergency money for something or for something big. I, I wasn't thinking real estate back in my 20s and 30s, but I always knew I could pull that money out for any reason. Um, so that was sort of my ace in the hole, having that. And then, so you mentioned earlier that you do 15 year mortgages vice 30. Why do you do 15? So the 15, if I can cash flow off a 15 year mortgage, I'm okay. Cause um, I have a W2 job and I enjoy my job. I'll, I'll, I'll work till I'm 65. But um, if, if I was trying to go for financial freedom and quit my job, like I, I know a lot of people, younger people are doing, uh, I'd go for the, I'd recommend the 30 year mortgages cause you'd have so much more monthly cash flow. Um, but for me, I'm cash flowing most of these on average, uh, two, 300 bucks a month. Um, and that's good enough. And that's off of a 15 year mortgage. So when I retire, nice. everything will be paid off. And let's say, I don't know, let's say I need a bunch of money for something, a wedding or want to buy a bigger house for myself or something. I can always do a cash out refi on any of my properties or sell them, but let's, I can always do a cash out refi. And my bank, uh, for a while, they're doing it. It was only taking two weeks to do cash out refis. I've done about three or four of those. Um, so if I do 15 year mortgages, everything will be paid off. Right now, the cash flow, my net cash flow now is 4,500 bucks a month. Um, that's if nothing breaks. That doesn't count. Maintenance, CapEx for big items like roofs and air conditionings and um, uh but right now, forty five hundred bucks a month is 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 plenty for me. Do you touch your uh, cash flow, and or you do you just live off only off your W two uh, paycheck? Yeah, I live off only my W two, and all the cash flow I get, I, it just goes right into the next rental or paying things off. So, for example, uh, last year, I had three rehabs. I bought a house, had a thirty thousand dollar rehab, and then I had a. I had a foreclosure as bad through the moratorium. These people uh, destroyed my house because I evicted them in court. Um, so I had to rehab that one, like literally like a month later. And then I had another one, a tenant just packed up, moved in the middle of the night. And that house just needed a ton of work. So I had three major rehabs um, within a year. So all my money in the six years I've been investing has been going to the next house, the next rehab, the next down payment. Um, so I haven't touched... I probably haven't touched a cent for myself. Uh, speaking of, so speaking of like COVID rent moratoriums, uh, what adjustments have you had to make uh, because of the rent moratoriums? Um, really, I haven't had to make um, too many adjustments. <clears throat> I've had maybe four tenants get behind on rent um, and they were all good tenants. And I just, I let them be late. I didn't even charge late fees. Uh, one tenant is habitually late. I charge her $50 a month late fees. But um, I was a, that particular tenant I was going to evict. I actually gave her the three-day pay or quit notice twice in the last six months. She finally caught up and, and got paid. But I've been more lenient uh, on my tenants uh, versus pre-COVID on that. I've, had, I've filled the vacancy. I've had two vacancies in the last year since COVID. Um, and both people had stable jobs at the time that they'd been there for several years. So it didn't really affect me. I really wasn't too worried about their uh, loss of employment. And that's it's funny. So being more being more humane in uh, in this COVID or pandemic time frame, uh, that's something I was writing on a, uh, I have like a blog on richdaymind.com. And so I, each year I write all the lessons I've learned as being a landlord. So I started writing up year two of being a landlord. And my last one or last tip or lesson learned was being humane. Uh, so throughout this last year, of COVID, <clears throat> a lot of tenants, uh, same thing for me, tenants thought rent was, rent was canceled, uh, wasn't paying at all. So I had to get creative. Amir and I had to get creative on how we were going to pay uh, our, I would say our mortgages because the goal was to never touch our personal W-2 ch paychecks to pay for these mortgages, like we refused. And so what we did was we got a lot of these guys uh, signed up to be the Section 8 or a program what we have out here called 4Kids, which is another rent, uh, rental assistance program. And so what we kind of did for one of our tenants was she's actually tomorrow is actually her last day uh, and she's supposed to be moving out. We uh, signed her up for four, uh, a rental assistance program that was going to help out for four months. And in those four months, that was an opportunity for her to find a job. She didn't communicate with us, didn't get a job. And so that was our test to say, hey, look, we looked out for you. 
you know, the rental assistance program gave us a, our 3,200 and then, you know, get out at your, at the end of your lease. Um, so we try to be lenient. Uh, I have, I also have a tenant that is late every month, but they pay the rent, they pay the late fee every month. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> it's a studio apartment. It's like $500. Um, and yeah, they're late every month, but, uh, you know, we make it, you know, we make it work and we try to be understanding. Uh, yeah, actually, definitely. And also, uh, you know, with COVID, I was more lenient on raising rents, you know, because yeah, that property too. taxes are going up, your expenses with your contractors and insurance and all that stuff has been going up. So uh, one, I was going to raise uh, an extra hundred bucks last May, you know, right in the middle, beginning of COVID. And I just, I said, well, I'll, I'll hold off and I'll get you next year. So I've been lenient that way. A couple other ones I've raised, instead of raising like 50 or 60 bucks, I raised like 30 bucks or something else like that. Um, so I'm pretty understanding with, um, with that and trying to work with my, my tenants. Because ultimately, part of my goal is, and the reason I've invested in single family versus multi is um, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who have the multifamily. There's a less turnover in the single family. Um, and so I try to treat these people like family. And I, I hope I'm going to have them for many years. And so if I, I feel like if I work with them, they're going to work with me. And so far that relationship has been working out really good and they seem very, very appreciative. So I hope I keep these people for the long run and try to have a heart. You know, you can, you, you can only do so much. Um, you don't want let them walk all over you, which it's, it's easy to happen. But during these times, if they've always been good tenants and they pay on time or they communicate with me ahead of time, then I'll definitely work with anybody. And I do feel like when it comes to single family homes, people are more likely to stay longer and treat it like it is their house uh, versus an apartment. Uh, I feel like the the mindset is different uh, because if I was renting out a home, you know, I'm going to, it, it feels like you, it feels like you own it. It, it feels like uh, for some people that may be the first home or house that they have a li- single family house they've ever lived in. And then maybe that's their transition into finally getting their own home uh, versus the mindset of the ap- apartment living. Right. And that's kind of how I, I treat my, my tenants in that regard. I would say your house is your house. This your even though it's my house, I want them to make it feel like it's, it's their house. I want them to sort of invest in it. Um, you know, whether it's landscape or I just bought a shed for some guy, uh, one of my tenants at, uh, at Costco said, Hey, would you, cause I converted the garage into a, a bedroom. Um, and they built it and they, they treat that house so well. Um, so in that regards, I want them to feel like it's going to be theirs for the long run. Cause most of my tenants, most of my properties are, I'd say we're in C plus class neighborhoods. Most of my tenants, blue collar. Um, I don't, most of them don't seem like they'll ever be able to either afford or qualify for a home of their own. Um, they're kind of paycheck to paycheck people. Um, they, they're pretty uh, transparent and open with their, their finances. And it seems mm-hmm. like most of these people are, kind of broken they're spending it all and i'm trying to educate them on working on their credit scores working on saving money uh, a down payment on a house or what they're looking at so they can get a place of their own because somebody did that to me when i was renting in my early 20s and i appreciate the landlord um, for that advice but uh, it seems like most of these people at the rate they're going they'll never be able to buy or afford a house so i want them to treat my house as if it's their house if they want to paint the inside walls if they want to uh, put things up in the backyard and stuff. I, I, no problem at all. It's, it's, uh, they're paying off my mortgages and, um, and for the most part, if they're pretty good, I keep them under market rate and, um, and it's good for them and it's good for me. So I don't get too many phone calls. They fix the leaky sinks. They fix the little things. And some only call me if it's something major, some of them, I don't, I don't hear from them for a whole year, you know, um, but it's worked out pretty good so far. So, uh, Speaking of, you know, when we're talking about these single family homes and you spoke on burring, uh, which by the way, because uh, we haven't explained it earlier, uh, BRRRR stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, uh, repeat. Oh, did I say right. four R's? So yeah. Right. So what's intimidating for a lot of people is the rehabbing part. I know for me, I've had my own uh, pitfalls when it comes to contractors. Uh, what? Do you have some type of system set in place to make sure that your burr uh, works out? Make sure you don't go over budget or at least too over budget so that you still have appreciation, you still have great cash flow. 
Um, I've done, gosh, maybe four or five, I think five major rehabs um, in the 30 to $50,000 range. Two of them that my contractor estimated with 30,000, they went right on budget, right on schedule. Um, two of them went like 20 grand more. <laughs> that was a rude awakening. Um, as far as contractors, now that's, I've been ripped off by, by one contractor. Once you find a good one, my advice is pay them well. Don't nickel and dime them. Don't kick the tires too much. Um, and they will treat you well. What's that uh, saying? Your, your net work is your net worth. Seriously, my contractor, I mean, he's worth gold because A, he brought me two off-market deals for really cheap. Yeah. Um, but B, he's, he's been there. All my, all my problems happen on Sunday nights or a holiday or something else like that. And I, I text this guy and he's there either the next morning or right there. So my advice is when you find someone good and hopefully you can find one through like a, a good recommendation from another investor, ask around who's a good contractor, who do you trust? But my second thing is kind of have a number in your mind, what you think the rehab is going to be. And if they're close to it or a little over, just, just go with them and, 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 and pay them. So this guy, I built a really good relationship with um, probably a little more cozy than most people would uh would be he actually has my credit card and he just goes to home depot usually they go to home depot and they call me over the phone and um i just pay with my credit card over the phone but this guy's running around so much for me lately i just says here's my here's my credit card just get whatever you need um save the receipts i can look up the receipts online anyway which i do on home depot because he loses receipts probably half the time but um, once you read, once you establish a good relationship with a contractor, man, just just go with them and don't ever, don't ever screw them or don't ever try to penny pinch with them. That's my biggest advice because when times are good um, and the economy has been on fire for the last few years, uh, the good contractors are hard to find, and um, anybody is, even plumbers, electricians, handymen, you name it, it's going to be really hard to find them because they're getting paid big money to go do rehabs like right now everybody has a lot of stimulus money or money pent up from this from COVID they haven't been traveling so my contractor for example he tells me he's getting all these rehabs that just people's primary homes like they want their bathroom remodeled or their kitchen remodeled and they're paying them crazy amounts of money to do it well the little mom and pop landlord like me asking for people to go you know rehab a house or go rehab a bathroom they don't want me uh, trying to nickel and dime them because they'll go to somebody else really quick and they won't answer my call next time or my text next time I want them to do it. So my advice is when you find somebody, keep them and pay them well because it'll pay off uh, in the long run. And that's a good tip. Uh, you know, ask other real estate investors and maybe you can even ask real estate agents because I've noticed some real estate agents are real estate investors uh, on being able to provide um, a good contractor because that has been definitely uh, the biggest hurdle I have. I, we found a decent property manager right now. Uh, we have one bad one. Um, he fired us actually, but uh, it, it, he was he was he was the horrible one. He was horrible. He, he tried to give the tenant their security deposit back uh, upon them just canceling at least before he even did an inspection. Like he just oh, does wow. stuff like that. Yeah. So definitely as we go into year three, because July will be year three for uh, Mira and I. Uh, we definitely have learned. I think the pandemic helped us learn a lot of things at warp speed because being that it was desperate times or what they say, modern issues make you come up with modern uh, solutions. And so right. uh, we, we had to come up with some modern solutions to the issues. And I think it has better prepared us even more for the things that we want to do. And you definitely, for each situation that you've had, you've definitely figured out a modern solution uh, and I think uh, you said, you know, you don't have the sexiest resume, but I think what you've been able to accomplish uh, would have been a, a overtowering, uh, you know, obstacle for a lot of people. When it comes to uh, credit cards, what do you how do you find these these credit card deals? Are you do you have a more, you know, a credit card company that you favor more towards? I noticed you talked about 12 month interest, uh, interest, zero interest. Uh, how do you, how do you go about doing that? So I, I was on some, I don't know, bigger pockets or some message board somewhere. And um, somebody was mentioning, they rattled off a few credit cards and I just Googled them. I just went on there and I looked at their offers. Um, I got, 
think three or four I've done in the last three years, maybe. I think I opened up two last year. Um, no interest for 12 months or no interest for 18 months. And they most of them will pay you 250 bucks for the first, I don't know, 3000 you spend or 5000 or something. And this one I got, American Express, through my LLC business card, they're giving me $250 for every 5000 I spend, um, no interest for a year. So what I do is um, I really should have a lot more in savings, but I only usually have about $20,000 in savings for you know things breaking down. Last year, I had the two unexpected rehabs. So I just opened up two credit cards, got the no interest for a year, and I put all our expenses on there. I told my wife, put all our daily expenses on there um, and we'll pay it back later. I know I can pay it back in a year and I'll put all my monthly um, rent income into there. Like I said, I'm making about 4,500 a month right now net. So all that money is just going towards uh, paying off these credit cards. Another thing I get ever since 1996, I get these convenience checks from city bank or city credit card. So I never, I always just rip those up, but I don't know, three or four years ago, I needed some cash quick. I think I had, I had a bunch of expenses that year. I had th three air conditioners go out that year, or that summer. It was awful, 2018. Um, so I ran out of cash. I went, to, I got those convenience checks and I looked at it and it was a 3% processing fee. So you got to pay 3% up front. But I think I did 10,000 bucks. So it cost me 300 bucks and it's no interest for a year. It just bought me time. It bought me 12 months to figure out how can I, pay this 10,000 bucks back. And like I said, all the money I make for my rentals, it just goes towards paying off. Um, if I have uh, some of those, some of that credit card debt, because I'm definitely against ever paying any interest on a credit card. We always pay our credit cards off, but um, there's been a couple of times, I wouldn't say an emergency, but like last year, it was just so much debt and I had to, I had to open up a, a couple more credit cards. Um, and like I said, I just had my wife and just, we said, just put everything on their groceries, everything on this. We'll deal with it. We got a month, a year to deal with it. And that's, it's worked for me. If you don't pay it off, you're, uh, man, you're just going to get hammered in interest. Have plan B, have plan C or D. But, um, and I always, I always do, but it's really helped me get through some um, costly rehabs. And um, also, once I do have everything paid off, I'm comfortable with only having, say, 20,000 bucks in the bank for emergencies. Some people, don't feel comfortable with that. They want, you know, 60, 80, hundred or, or 10,000 per property. But for me, I know I've got those no interest for a year convenience checks from Citibank and I can just, and they, they give me up to 20,000 bucks. I know I got $20,000 and it goes in my bank right away. I think you got to wait two or three days for it to process, but that's kind of my, my backup. And then it buys me time to, to pay it off. And so we, in the military, we also have our own version of our 401k, which is our TSP thrift savings plan. And so we've also used uh, our TSP loan for uh, one of our properties as well. And then, you know, we've been paying it off. And then we intend to do another loan to uh, use for another one of our properties. Uh, we can, we also are able to use our VA loan, so our VA home loan. And so that's how we are, we're able to get up to four units because it's still considered a residential property. And so we could use four, uh, use the VA loan to get four units. And then we could say we were going to live in one of them for a year. And then that's how we're able to do that. We're able to do that on a yearly basis. So that's how some military people kind of scale up on, on a yearly annual basis, uh, maybe the four, seven, 12 units within three to four years. And they just house. Oh, hack. That's a great. Yeah, that's, that's a great deal. Uh, for me, what's worked also is uh, just doing those cash out refis. Once you, once you rehab a house up to pull that um, capital out, for example, I bought a house with a 401k loan about two and a half years ago for 48,000, I fixed it up, put a tenant in there for 1400 a month. So um, right now I'm kind of getting a real estate bug. So I want to get another rental house, talk my wife into let me get one this year. So what I do is pull all that money out. So I was all in for a hundred thousand, about 50 for the purchase, 50 for rehab. I mean, I had to redo everything on the house. So it's basically brand new. Um, it should appraise for 160. My bank will give me they said they'd give me like 112,000, 110,000. So I'll get all my capital out plus like 10,000. And then I'll go put that money in with as cash and buy another junkie beater and then uh, rehab that up. And then uh, maybe a six months or a year later, pull all that money out and then go do another one. So that's another way too. If you can somehow scrap up the cash, I know it's hard for people to get the cash for a house, 
But um, in my case, that scenario was just a 401k. So I'm still paying myself back. It's a five-year loan. I'm paying myself back. But after I, um, after I get a cash out refund, it'll still cash flow about 350 bucks a month. So I basically got a free house, getting 350 bucks a month uh, cash flow on it. And it's on a 15-year mortgage. So it'll be paid off all in 15 years. And I got all my money back plus an extra 10 grand. So that's kind of a way I've, I've used uh, since I've run out of money. It's just, it, you can't just save up money and put 20% down on house after house. I mean, it takes you forever to, for the average person to save up the money. Yes. But um, my very first purchase I bought uh, six years ago, the one I had to scrounge up the money for, uh, I paid 134. A bank gave me back 140,000. I did a cash out refund on that. It, I didn't even fix it up. It just, it appraised, it, uh, it appreciated over like three years. And they gave me all my money back plus an extra 10 grand. And then I bought another house for cash, fix it up, um, put a tenant in there and then uh, did a cash out refi on that. So they gave me my, all my cash back and then I bought another one. So that, that tool has worked with, uh, let's see, four purchases by doing the Burr method. And it really, it really works. Some of my houses, I didn't get all my money back. I left maybe 20 grand in. But I'm okay with that, um, leaving a little bit of skin in the game, as long as they're cash flowing good. But yeah. um, but, but uh, that that seems to work pretty good. But the cat the home the two homes I do have right now that I own outright from uh, my cash purchases they make about a thousand bucks a month. One makes twelve hundred net, and the other one makes like nine hundred or about thousand dollars net. So it is nice to have two completely paid off. But part of me thinks like, gosh, I could use that capital, you know. And, pull it out and scale up and, and uh, get another one. So I'm just kind of thinking I'll just do maybe, maybe one a year um, just in case we're in a real estate bubble or something else like that happens. It's sort of like buying stocks, kind of dollar cost averaging. You're kind of slowly buying over a period, a long period of time. That's kind of my theory on that. I'll just maybe buy one, one a year and, and that works out good. How much uh, percentage are you getting back with your uh, cash out refi? Is it 80% the bank's been giving you? Uh, no, my credit union is only doing 70% back. Um, one I did was 80%, but the last few is just uh, 70% of whatever it appraises at. So <laughs> the key is if it appraises high, you're, you're looking good. So this one's going to um, appraise 60000 over what I paid for it. So I'll, I'll get all my money back plus a little. Oh, okay, good. And so explain this to me, please. So when you say in a house is paid off, you can no longer use the equity in it like you did when you had it, when it was it had leverage on it and you still had a mortgage on it. Yeah, I the there was two houses I just paid all cash. My very initial one we talked about and then the other one that I uh, had a 401k and I just paid cash completely for the house. It was only 48,000. But um, yeah, I never had a mortgage on those two. And then later on, I decided to go to my bank and say, hey, can I take some cash out? And they said, sure, let's appraise it. And they gave me a certain value. I didn't know how much it appraised for. I didn't know how much they're going to give me back. But um, that's kind of uh, what I've been doing. Gotcha. And so it sounds like I like I like this, your method, because I feel like. Oh, let's stop for a second. I, I like your method because I feel like it's not it's manageable. I feel like it's, it's not something that's overwhelming. Because for me, like I wanted 200 units by the time I retired from the Navy. But your, your method is it's manageable. It's gonna be, you're going to be able to take care of your, your needs, right? You're going to be able to live off of it. And you're not going to be pulling out your hair. You don't need a team. You, know, you don't have board members. And you're sitting out every, every month having a meeting with you know, five other people. Uh, <laughs> and you're right. able to take care, take care of everything on your own. And so uh, I want to ask, uh, what was your vision your, your rich state of mind as to why you were, you're doing this uh, because clearly you have a, you have a, a, a dream, a vision, a dream that you have now turned into reality. And then once you retire, you'll be able to live that out. So what, what's your why? Right. So I've got two whys. One of them is um, just um, generational wealth, legacy wealth. My kids will inherit this. Um, and when my wife and I died, there's a, that's there's they won't have to pay any taxes on it that step up cost basis whatever if they want to sell it the day I, we die they get all this wealth and they can they can cash it out or they can have uh put them on autopilot with a property manager and they'll have this for the rest of their lives they won't have to stress about getting a high-paying job 
they won't have to stress about debt. They'll have a lot of money that'll be uh, handed on to them. Um, the other, the other reason this is, this really hit me first was I went to some real estate seminar. Um, and this, they said they, uh, this guy was talking about the stock market and having all your money in the, in the stock market in your 401k or Roth IRAs or whatnot. About every eight to 10 years, the market just dips. It corrects pretty, pretty hard. If you're retired, if I retire today and I'm counting on pulling out a certain amount out of my 401k every month and the stock market goes way down, it's going to take so long for the, for the stock market to go up to get that money back. My account's going to dwindle rapidly if the market's down for a while. And I'm going to be, going to be stressed. If the market went down 30% tomorrow and I got to keep pulling out all this, it's going to make me nervous thinking, oh my gosh, I might run out of money. Am I going to make it till 70, 80 or whatever your goals are? Um, so part of me was thinking, ah, I'd like to diversify a little bit into something else that will give me uh, income that's not uh, reliant on, this, on the stock market. So the rental properties was sort of my, it, it kind of makes me sleep better at night knowing that I'll be in blue collar neighborhoods, C plus neighborhoods where I don't think I'm going to have much vacancy when times are really bad. So we're going to have that bad economic times. I mean, it's just, it happens every decade or so. It's a, it's a given. But I feel like my niche with these rental properties are uh, con compared to like really nice A and B class properties where people might downgrade to cheaper ones. I feel like I'm always going to have tenants. There's always going to be uh, a need for housing. And so that money should be coming in. Maybe I have to lower rent a little bit, maybe not. Um, but when the stock market crashes and I'm retired, I've got this passive income coming in so I can sleep better at night. and the money I have in my 401k, I feel like um, I have it all in equities, all in stocks. I feel like as I get older, I don't have to put, say, 40 or 60% in bonds or, you know, worry about that to make sure you have that safe money. I feel like I've just been letting it ride, um, investing on the more aggressive side. And I feel like I can do that till I uh, get closer to retirement age at 65 because I know I have my rental income coming in. Um, and like I said, it should be 10 to 12,000 a month after my expenses. I'll probably pick up more properties, but right now with my 10 properties, um, 10 grand a month, I mean, heck, I can we can live off that. Our house will be exactly. paid off by then. My, our kids will be out of the, you know, out of the house. So I could just live off that, but I'll put the money in the stock market and I'll just let that grow aggressively. So that's kind of like my rich state of mind thinking. And also for my kids. I don't put pressure on them. Like you got to get in the best college. You have to make all this money. You have to, I tell them, I want you to pursue whatever you want. Don't think about money. Uh, don't worry about salaries. Uh, just do something that you're really happy with. Cause I know that they'll inherit these. Um, maybe we'll give them one of the houses, the first house or something else like that. So it kind of gives me a peace of mind knowing that they won't have to worry or struggle financially. Cause they'll have this, uh, this legacy generational wealth for, uh, to, to inherit. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, I think you, this story, like I said, your story and how you've been able to, to amass uh, literally multi-million uh, dollars worth of properties in five years, which to some people may seem like is a short amount of time, but how you did it, you got really creative. I think this is very, uh, very informative and very inspiring to people that feel like on a, on a smaller scale, how can I still manage this and still be able to be financially free, be set for retirement. So John, I really appreciate you taking this time this evening uh, to break all that down. You're such a humble guy, by the way. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank I appreciate you. it. All right. Take care. You too.